Um, yeah, let's do the book, shall we? Recap. Let, previously, on A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Banking, things, dun, dun. things went really, really, really a lot wrong. I mean, all of the wrong that they could go. Pretty much, they went. Um, Mona was nar Mona narrowly escaped the, the uh, Green Man and was saved by Bob, who just went full gloopy Rottweiler on him. And Mona and Spindle uh, hid out then very sensibly because, you know, Mona needs to have this experience. She was like, I'm going to the police. Someone is being naughty. Went to the police and my favorite trope, and this is genuinely one of my all-time favorites, uh, hits where she explains what happened and the cop goes, oh, oh, no, not to worry. Come with us, Mona. I didn't tell you my name. Dun, dun, dun. Big chase. Constables. Bridges. Floating on bread. <laughs> Floating on bread. Because Mona it can only use magic where bread is concerned. But she can make bread do very nearly anything it can, it's physically capable of. So they had this old loaf with them. And they tore it into four chunks and basically used it as skates almost. Yep. They floated down the, the canal. Almost. Loaf surfing, as Withmore has put it. Or bread feet from Specky. Uh, and successfully escaped. So now the only thing they have to worry about is that they are someone's trying to kill them. And the, the police seem to be involved and not on the right side. And they have no resources. And they're on the run. So nothing to worry about, really. Chapter 13. I'm sorry I called you a street rat, I said, flicking a pebble into the murky water. Oh, before we go any further, uh, water, food, get comfortable, meds, pets secure. Content warnings. Content warnings. Um, murder mystery and mild threat, if I remember correctly. Yes, murder mystery, mild threat, and uh, yeast under stress. Yeah. Yes, content warning, murder mystery, accents. Chapter 13. <laughs> content warning. Content warning, gluten. gluten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <sighs> I'm sorry I called you a street rat, I said, flicking a pebble into the murky water. It's okay, said Spindle, hunching up inside his jacket. You're not used to this sort of thing. And was sitting inside the sewers, or at least some tunnels that had probably originally been dug as sewers. Now they were very much larger, as generations of smugglers running goods up the river had used them as a landing point and illicit entry to the city. We'd nearly wound up in the river ourselves before our sliced bread floats gave out completely, but there had been a tiny little beach, if you can call it a beach when the sand is mostly covered in bits of packing crates and stubbed out cigar butts, and we'd abandoned our bread and waded up onto it. It stank. I want to be absolutely clear on that. I mean, it could have been a lot worse. The river carried a lot of it away, but it still stank. Outhouse at noon kind of stink, with wet green mucky stink mixed in, and the faintest patina of is that a dead thing rotting nearby on top. After wading in it, Spindle and I stank too. The gingerbread man made a show of holding his nose. Quiet, you, I muttered. Don't even think you've got a sense of smell. He waved a hand in front of his face exaggeratedly, but even that wasn't enough to cheer me up. I'm going to catch some kind of horrible disease. It'll kill me before the spring green man gets the chance. Anyway, Spindle said, unrolling his sleeves so the grubby cuffs dangled over his fingers. You got dropped into this sudden light. You weren't born on the streets, like me. He jerked a thumb at his chest and sat up a little straighter. So I guess it's not your fault you're a bit bacon brained after this magnanimous speech, I didn't feel like arguing, although bacon-brained. Really? Actually, I, I would have killed for some bacon. Even the horrible stink wasn't enough to make me forget that I was really hungry. I hoped I was the only hungry thing down here. If there were undead crawfish remaining anywhere in the city, it was probably somewhere nearby. I listened with the clicking of terrible, tiny claws. I didn't hear anything. So, now what do we do? Asked Spindle. I have no idea, 
Truth be told, I'd been hoping he'd have an idea. Can we get back to Knacker and Molly's? Spindle thought about it. Maybe. Well, I can. Probably. But you shouldn't be going out until it's dark. If the constables get sight of you, I don't know if we can give them the slip twice. My stomach growled again. Spindles growled in response. We both snickered. We have to get some food, I said, or else I'll die down here, and I don't want to give the Inquisitor the satisfaction. Spindle bounced to his feet. Well, here's what I'm thinking. If we follow the smugglers' tunnels, we'll get to wherever they go to deliver their stuff, and I'll bet you anything there's a tavern. A tavern? Why a tavern? I stood up and dusted myself off. The gingerbread man steadied himself on my earlobe and went back to picking bits of waterweed out of my hair. Spindle gave me a superior look. Because they smuggle booze. Don't you pay attention? Bring it up the coast. Sell it to taverns. What? Illegally? Really? I tried to imagine smugglers selling rum to the tavern down the street from the bakery. The innkeeper had really bad dandruff and his shoulders looked like a powdered sugar donut, but he was always really nice to me, so I tried not to look at his shoulders when I talked to him. I had to run down and arrange the order of dark ale for the beer bread, and once Aunt Tabitha had gotten a big order in for the rum cakes and had to order a half keg of rum. I put a hand over my mouth. The innkeeper had been breaking the law the whole time. Did Aunt Tabitha know about this? Spindle laughed at me, but not unkindly. Come on, then. He started up the tunnel, and I followed. Sure enough, the tunnels came out at a tavern. Well, they probably came out at all kinds of places, but the one we followed, based on a few chalk arrows and squiggles that Spindle claimed were thief sign, came out in the alley behind a very seedy establishment called the Hanging Goat. Wait here, said Spindle, leaving me in the alley, and ducked through the open door into the back of the tavern's kitchen. The smells coming out weren't promising, but since the smell coming off me was truly apocalyptic, who was I to judge? I hunkered down in the alley and fidgeted. I could see people walking past the mouth of the alley, and they looked really normal. Nobody was trying to kill them. I'd been like that once. That seemed like a very long time ago. A guard in a blue uniform went by the alley mouth, and I scrambled back farther into the pile of trash. He didn't even glance down the alley. The gingerbread man patted my ear comfortingly. Spindle re-emerged, clutching a lump of something wrapped in rags, and grabbed my arm. Come on, she'll notice they're gone in a minute. We've got a scarper. So we scarpered, which apparently meant run away very fast. Two blocks over, we stopped, climbed a metal staircase in yet another alley, and Spindle unwrapped his prize, a pair of meat pies. They were still burning hot and, if I'm honest, somewhat squashed. Nicked him off the cooling rack, said Spindle proudly, juggling his from hand to hand. Here, be careful, you'll roast yourself. I said. The filling was still boiling hot and scalded the roof of my mouth and the crust was just deeply inferior compared to one of mine. The cook was letting the butter get too warm when she made it. The meat was probably horse. It was wonderful. Thanks, I told Spindle, who was eating his rather more slowly. You just saved my life. I was going to starve to death right here. He rolled his eyes. So, I said when he'd finished licking the crumbs off his fingers. Now where do we go? Back to Knacker and Molly? Best I could think of, he admitted. But first, we're stealing some clothes out of the poor box in Hanover Street. I didn't much like the thought of stealing clothes out of the poor box, but desperate times called for desperate measures. Do we need a disguise? Disguise? Nothing, said Spindle, climbing down the staircase. He stopped at the bottom and looked up, wrinkling his nose. We need clean clothes and a dip in a cistern. We stink. Dramatic tea. <sighs> Chapter 14. Five days later, I sat in the church bell tower, building a circus out of bread. Knacker and Molly had been hard to find. When Spindle finally tracked her down, I'd spent half the night hiding in back alleys and under bridges, shivering inside stolen clothes that were two sizes too big for me. Molly didn't apologise for having left us for so long, or yell at us for leaving. 
I'm not entirely sure if she realized that she was a grown-up and we were kids, or if she knew and it just didn't matter to her in the slightest. Maybe that sort of thing didn't apply anymore. If grown-ups were trying to kill you, did that make you an honorary grown-up? If so, I would have preferred to just grow up and get my period like a normal person. Got a theory, Molly said when we had talked, explaining our narrow escape. I've been talking to some people who saw the spring green man working like you did, girl. I think he's magic too. Yeah, but his talent's something to do with air and smells. Maybe not so good for killing people, but good for sniffing out other magic. And he's got the knife for the killing bit. I remembered that strange, heavy smell around him, and how my brain felt foggy when I smelled it. But why would he want to kill us? I asked, pulling my oversized coat tighter around me. Maybe he's crazy, she said, shrugging. You'd know, said Spindle, not entirely under his breath. More like somebody's paying him. You talked about that Inquisitor fellow, you said, so I'm guessing you don't need to be looking much farther. But why would the Inquisitor want to kill wizards? Knackering Molly shook her head. A moment later, Nag shook his and stamped one bony hoof. The answer to that question won't be found at street level, girl. I asked down in the rat's nest and at the goblin market, and they know nothing about and they know about the spring green man, and somebody even saw him and smelled him, but they ain't telling but there ain't no telling what's behind him. Here, yeah, what about knuckle bones? asked Spindle. Knucklebones knows all kinds of stuff from my pie. Used to be a lady's maid, she always says. Knucklebones is headed out of town on the first horse she can steal, said Molly. A kid's got a magic of daddy, and even if it don't normally breed true, she's running. And Mona is the only one who's tangled with the Inquisitor. Her lips twisted. Politics is what it is. Spindle spat on the ground. Well, now what do we do? I asked Loomily. I didn't see a way of defeating politics with bread. They're talking about bringing in sniffers to look for you. That thing they will, but if they do, that's a lot of money on someone who wants you dead. A lot of work too, said Spindle. you got to keep them wet. Sniffers are just like bloodhounds, said Molly, rather more cheerfully. Track you for miles, but there's ways of throwing them off, and they can't get them in any closer than Delta C, so you've got a couple of days. Grab all the next tail. So we followed Molly again, and she led us to a little church, only a few blocks away from Our Lady of Sorrowful Angels, but not nearly so well appointed. I hung back nervously. I'd just stolen clothes from a church poor box. I wasn't sure how good my credit was with the divine, but she rode Nag right up into the churchyard and urged Spindle and me towards a small door in the wall. Fry is stone deaf, she said, and the lay brothers are good enough sort. They'll not trouble you, and they'll bring you two square meals a day on the strength of me asking. She frowned. I don't know, but the scent of aloe ground will cover over magic. Mayhap it won't. Maybe it's just a superstition, like making a magic or a lion in court. But it can't hurt. If the spring green man comes for you, girl, run. Folks here are priests, not fighters. There's little enough they can do for you, but die trying. I gulped. I'll keep an ear to the ground. If I learn anything, I'll be in touch. She swung Nag around and clattered out of the courtyard without saying goodbye. Spindle looked at me. I looked at Spindle. And then we went inside the church because we didn't know what else to do. Well, I suppose I could leave the city. I begged Spindle to take me to the gate and just start walking. But what would I do? What would I eat? Even I can't make bread out of rocks and road dust, not unless I get a lot of extra ingredients. And what about Aunt Tabitha? They said sniffers could find places you'd even thought of being, and that meant they'd be all over the bakery. What if Inquisitor Oberon decided to accuse her of something? The church was small and very shabby. The pews looked worn, and the altar cloth had been eaten by moths until it was more holes than fabric. The lay brother was as good as Molly's word. He was a tall, craggy-faced man, and he didn't ask questions. He led me to a ladder and pointed up. The bell tower, he said, nodding to himself. We sold the bells long ago, you understand. The tower cannot be sold. There is little up there that will harm you. I would not go to the top room where the bells were. There are bats. After this inspiring speech... 
He nodded again and left. Spindle and I went up the ladder and found that the room was almost claustrophobically small, not very warm, and the edges of the entry shaft were splattered with bat droppings. Cozy, said Spindle. I peered out the single slitted window. I could see a number of roofs and across them the Church of Sorrowful Angels. The view's nice. The gingerbread man hopped off my shoulder and stood in the window, gazing out. And it was defensible. If nothing else, the spring green man had only one way in, and if I kicked the ladder down, not even that. Of course, that meant I only had one way out, too. You're the one stuck here, not me, said Spindle. He stuck his hands in his pockets. Can I do anything for you? Tell Aunt Tabitha where I am, he said. I said. If you can get me paper and deliver a letter. Spindle was shaking his head. Knacker and Molly already told me not to. They've got guards all over town, and some of them got a look at me when we gave them the slip the other day. He frowned. You got bet that spring green man sniffing all over around there, and if he smells you on me, he could track you back here. I sagged. This was worse than I thought. Aunt Tabitha had to be worried sick. Hey, said Spindle, it's not so bad. It's only till they stop looking for you. I'll snitch you some food during the day, though. A place like this, it's nothing but gruel, gruel, more gruel. As it happened, he wasn't far wrong. It was gritty porridge for breakfast and half an onion and a slab of dark bread for supper. The onion was tolerable, actually, although it did terrible things to my breath. The bread was an affront to the baker's art. It took more energy to make it edible than I got from eating it. After the second day, I stopped even trying to eat it and began moulding it into tiny people and animals, which I tried to set into motion. Believe it or not, I've actually never spent a lot of time really working on my magic. I was always more interested in learning how to bake. Baking's much more rewarding. There are cookbooks to tell you what to do, and at the end you've got chocolate chip cookies. There aren't any books to teach you how to do magic, or if there are, they aren't available to people like me. So when I do magic, it's more of an instinctive thing. When the bread is burning, I don't stop and think, I must magic the bread so it doesn't burn. I just do it, reflexively. Like when somebody hits a glass of water with their elbow and you grab for it before it goes over. You don't think, I am going to grab that glass. I wouldn't have known that I could animate Gingerbread Man if I hadn't done it once already as a little kid. And when you don't know stuff is impossible, you can try anything. The magic I try to do deliberately doesn't work nearly as well, unless I'm panicked. Like when I made the getaway bread float, or brought Bob the sourdough starter to life. There is something about stark terror that really gets my magic working. Unfortunately, being stuck in a bell tower isn't quite the same thing. I was terrified, sure, but it was a boring sort of terror. You can't stay in a state of heart-pounding panic for very long. Your body just can't manage it. So I just sit there and stare out the window and think about being in the city. Then I'd start to think about Aunt Tabitha and how worried she must be. And then I'd remember all over again what was happening and I'd be angry and scared and tired. I slept. A lot. Sleep was at least time passing that I didn't have to be around for. Spindle brought me a pack of cards. That was fun for a bit, but I made the mistake of teaching the gingerbread man the rules of solitaire. After that, whenever I tried to cheat and run through the discard pile an extra time, he'd kick me in the wrist and sit on the cards. I taught him to play rummy, even though the cards were half as big as he was. He beat me eleven times in a row, and then refused to play anymore. I think I bored him. It was probably a good thing that we didn't have a checkerboard. There was one other good thing. Stuck up there for days with an increasingly large pile of inedible bread, I finally had time to practice my magic. So, I started by smooshing the bread together into balls and moulding little figures out of them, then making them walk around. It sort of worked. They weren't nearly as responsive as the gingerbread men. It felt like the chunks of bread really didn't want to come together. Maybe I have to bake stuff into a human shape before it believes it's human, I said to the gingerbread man. He eyed my shambling bread crust creature with disapproval and shrugged. He was building a house out of cards, which was a major construction project for someone his size. My bread creatures also... 
weren't smart. When I made a couple of them and told them to march around the room, they stopped as soon as they ran into a wall. I sighed and took them apart again. When Spindle came back that night, I had a request. Hey, Spindle. Ooh. His mouth was full. He'd gotten in the habit of eating a meal with me, and I felt almost pathetically grateful for the company. I knew that he didn't have to keep bringing me food, and if he decided to ditch me, it's not like I'd ever find him again. He'd probably be in a lot less danger, too, since he wasn't a magicker, and the Spring Green Man might not even care that he existed. Can you get me some dough? Stuff that hasn't been cooked yet. He wiped his mouth. It'll be harder than cook stuff, but sure, I guess. I was seized with a pang of misgiving. Don't do it if it's too hard. I, I don't want you to get caught. He gave me a disgusted look. Gil, you are looking at the thief who pinched the socks off the feet of the head of the jeweler's guild. Too hard. <laughs> he was as good as his word, too. The next morning, I heard a rattling on the ladder, and he came up carrying a sack which held an entire mixing bowl of dough, dough included, and a number of battered onions. I examined the dough. It was full of papery onion skin and bits of dirt. What? asked Spindle. You weren't going to eat it, were you? I guess not. My onions? Pretended to sell them, he said proudly. Took a basket into the kitchen at the White Horse and offered them to the cook. While she was yelling at somebody, I dumped a bowl into the basket and put onions over the top. Very impressive. This is perfect, Spindle. Thank you. I hugged him. He squirmed out and gave me a reproachful look, but his ears turned red. And I'm pretty sure that meant he was pleased. Dramatic tea. <sighs> Chapter 15. The magic experiments went so much better with dough than with bread. The dough was, well, smarter, I guess. More suggestible. The bread that had already been baked had a very clear idea that it was a loaf. It had always been a loaf. It would always be a loaf. The dough was willing to be little people or animals or anything else I wanted it to be. They were gloppy people and animals, so I couldn't make them very large, and they were awfully sticky. I needed more flour, but I didn't want to keep making demands of spindle. It was already being so nice. But if you told them to walk around the room, they'd walk around the room. When they hit a wall, they would turn around and walk in another direction. If I took a nap, when I woke up, they'd be in different positions. One ran into the gingerbread man's card house and got thrown out through the window. Turns out my cookie had a temper. I could feel the dough, a little, inside my head. They were so small that I had to really pay attention, but it wasn't like I had anything else to do. It was just a kind of little mental tugging. It didn't do much, but it did make me tired after a while, so I was careful to pull the magic out of them at night before I went to sleep. When I concentrated, I could feel something similar from the gingerbread man. Now that I was looking for it, it had been going on for so long, though, that I didn't even notice anymore. If you wear really heavy boots in the winter, you stop noticing that they're heavy after a few days, and then when you take them off, your feet feel just ridiculously light. I was staring out the window one afternoon when a couple of pigeons landed on a drain pipe, the corner of the roof below. One pushed the other off the edge and it flapped frantically, tumbled a few feet, and then flew laboriously back up to the roof. Hmm. I looked down at the dough in my hands and made little dough dogs and horses. Could I make a dough bird? I started to get excited by the thought. If I could make a bird out of dough, could I send it with a message to Aunt Tabitha? It was much too far for even my gingerbread man to walk, but a bird could fly, and bread was lightweight, wasn't it? I hastily pinched out the shape of wings. The end result was... gummy. It would undoubtedly have been better if I could bake it, but maybe with enough magic it wouldn't matter. I held the lumpy bird in both hands and thought... It came alive like the others, flopping its wings. They stretched and drooped under the weight of the dough. This wasn't going to work if it kept being so heavy. Could I convince the dough that it was lighter? You're light, I told it. You're as light and flaky as the inside of a croissant. You weigh nothing at all. The dough bird flapped wetly. Did it feel lighter? I couldn't tell. 
Do I need more magic? I tried to pump more magic into it through that odd little link in my head. Light, I thought frantically. You weigh nothing. You weigh less than air. It didn't exactly feel like pouring magic into the dough, like you pour milk into a mixing bowl. It was more like trying to knead magic into it, like kneading flour into a really, really stiff dough. The bird didn't want any more magic in it. It couldn't all fit. My head was starting to hurt. Light, light, you can fly. The dough strained and very slowly started to rise into the air. Come on, I said out loud, my vision throbbing in time with my heartbeat. Come on, you can do it. Slowly, lumpily, with holes opening in its wings, the doe bird flew. I did it, I yelled, not caring if the lay brother heard me. I did it, I, um. The bird was beginning to vibrate. It was puffing up to two and three times its original size. It spun around the ceiling, bits of dough flying off its wings and splattering against the stones. My gingerbread man threw himself off the windowsill and grabbed my pant leg, tugging me down. I tried to grab for the little magical connection in my head and it felt fizzy, hot. That is not a nice sensation to have in your brain. The bird let out a whistle of escaping steam and exploded. The room rained out. I got a gob in my face. It was hot, nearly scalding. The gingerbread man took shelter beneath my calf. When a couple of minutes had passed and I had scraped the dough off the side of my nose, I surveyed the damage. The bird was gone. The stone walls looked as if they had been caught in a very lumpy snowstorm. The inside of my head felt bruised. I sat down and clutched it, and that did not help at all. Let the record show, I said to the gingerbread man, Fred was not meant to fly. There wasn't much usable dough left. The bits of bird I managed to scrounge from the corners of the room were weirdly spongy, so I set yeast dough out to rise and forgotten about it for a week. When I tried to give it magic, it wouldn't take. The magic just slid off, as if the dough had been oiled. I went back to trying the bread crusts again got easier with practice. In fact, I found out that if I only used crust from one loaf, it worked even better. Two loaves that hadn't been baked together just didn't get on. They didn't want to cooperate at all. There was no getting it to work with the remaining dough, either. The two rejected each other completely. The dough legs would walk off without the bread crust body. One actually yanked its own bread crust arm off and threw it at the wall. Baked and unbaked dough are not friends. I didn't try to make another bird. I had a feeling that I'd run up against the limits of what even magic bread could do. But I did make tiny animals and people, and if I set them a repetitive task, they did okay. The gingerbread man wasn't impressed. I couldn't blame him. If I'd been able to bake my creations, I could have done a lot more with them. Spindle, delivering the only edible meal of the day, stopped dead as soon as he climbed up the ladder. Core, what's that? It's a circus, I said. The red crust elephant waved its trunk. I'm bored. Never. S <laughs> I never saw a circus for real, said Spindle, getting down on his knees. Is this what they look like? Well, they're usually bigger, I said, grinning. He flapped a hand at me, and a lot more colourful, and I couldn't do the trapeze, but this is sort of like it. He brought up another meat pie, this one cold rather than molten, and a lump of cheese. I devoured them while he watched the bread circus go through its paces, the elephant posing, the bread girl riding the bread horse, both rather lumpy. I wasn't very good at horses. The lion shaking its crumbly mane. This must have taken you hours, said Spindle, impressed. I snorted. I've got nothing but time. It's boring up here, and the gingerbread man gets really grumpy if I try and cheat at solitaire. Ah, brought you something. He reached under his jacket and pulled out a grubby sheet of paper. Hmm? I took it and unfolded it, smoothing out the creases. What is... I stopped. I stared down at the paper. My own face stared back at me. And that's where we'll leave it for today. <laughs>